Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is Lecture 19 in the History Series on Art History Textbooks in Other Countries. I have just one slide for an introduction. Then we're going to look at a world art history written in Russia, one written in Turkey, one written in India. So the idea of this is to look at other people's world art histories uh, before we uh, spend time looking at ones that are generally assigned in North America. So first of all, Russian world art history. This was written in 1956 at the Institute for the Theory and History of the Visual Arts at the Academy of Arts in Moscow, apparently involved the collaboration of about 150 scholars in Russia. And nine years later, it was translated into German which is the edition that I've seen. In the German edition, it runs about 6,900 pages, and it's eight really big volumes. It's an anti-modernist history because it represents a Soviet uh, point of view um, and privileges art that is considered to be not modernist by Western and North American standards, and I'll explain that as I go along. It's a massive accomplishment, incomparable in volume to the German Propylae of Art History that I introduced in the last lecture. And like most of those multi-volume histories of art, which is also quite very much like an encyclopedia, it begins back uh, in the Neolithic. The first six volumes move really quickly through Mesopotamia and Greece and Rome and then through Byzantine medieval art, and that's following also the German model. So I would skip on to volume seven on the 19th century this is surprising because there's so much European art outside of France, England, and Germany. If you look in your own art history textbook, if you look for the 19th century, you probably find very little outside of France, England, and Germany. But if you have a look at this, which is part of the table of contents, uh, you'll see a lot of unusual chapters. You're not going to find chapters like you see on the right there on Hungarian art, Czech and Slovak art, Polish art, art of Yugoslavia. These were, of course, all... Um, countries that were in the, uh, in the sway of the Soviet uh, regime, um, and so they get privileged throughout this book. The last two volumes, which are on the 20th century, are even more different from English language textbooks. Here's part of that table of contents for those last two volumes. There's no other art history text that has separate chapters on modern art in Indonesia, or Iceland, Ceylonese art, you can see there, Burmese art. And notice also the demotion of the United States. It, it happens to be at the top of the right-hand column there. That's because I split it. It's actually just on the list of countries along with everybody else. Um, so from an American point of view, um, it's a little strange to be after Greek art, Spanish art, art of Scandinavia, divided into five different chapters, by the way, um, and right before Canadian art, art of Latin America, and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a very unusual arrangement, and it's much more international in this sense, much more multicultural than even the really large 1,000 plus page doorstop um, textbooks that we'll be looking at in the next couple lectures. This universal history of art, it's a Stalinist project, and it's intended to demonstrate that Western art outside of communist countries is, is aimless, it's lost its way, it's purely formal, that is to say it doesn't have real spirit, it doesn't have real content. Uh, and it's decadent, represents a decadent phase of culture, very different from the, what the Communist Party was um, presenting itself as. Communist art is the culmination of art history in, this, uh, in these textbooks. It's the apotheosis of art history. Um, so you could see these headings here, Art of the USSR at the top, with uh, a lot of subheadings that you would also never see in your textbooks. And then under that, Art of the Socialist Countries in Europe, Art of the Socialist Countries in Asia and Latin America, and that's the kind of thing that, that would be, it, the categories wouldn't exist in textbooks written outside of uh, the Soviet influence. Um, and a lot of the content, of course, wouldn't be included. Most of the art in the 20th century volumes of the Universal History is social realism, the kind of art that's often disparaged in North American textbooks. That kind of art is usually called anti-modern because it was made under an authoritarian state that discouraged modernist values and promoted realistic painting based on 19th century academic training. And I'll just give one example of anti-modern art. There you go. There's an anti-modern art uh, artwork. 
this is Adolf Ziegler, who I showed in Lecture 814, who was uh, one of Hitler's favorite contemporary painters. Um, so it's ideal in an academic sense, idealizing, and in this case also uh, propagandistic. The modern art that is included in the universal history of art, that is not the anti-modernist, but the modernist art, is usually conservative or fairly traditional. Uh, here's an example, the Romanian painter uh, Teodor Palladi, and we saw one of his paintings in Lecture 9, uh, because I was talking about the overlooked um, modernist movement in Romania. But because it was a relatively belated, relatively conservative modernist movement, and because it continued under uh, Soviet influence, uh, it's part of this book. Another example also from Romania, who's in this book, is the sculptor Ion Irimescu. And here's what the book has to say about him. Irimescu made important works in both monumental and genre sculpture. The Peasant Woman of 1961 is a beautiful young farm girl who holds a flower in her hand. It's not this sculpture, it's one that's very much like it. She has the embodiment of Romanian folk art, which has always created beautiful things and always will. Irimescu also sculpted a row of workers' heads, among them the famous Steel Caster, 1954, and the Welder. They embody the typical character of the socialist working people of Romania. That's, of course, not the kind of text you would find in a North American uh, textbook, and you can see the uh, orientation of the text from this. Before I go on to the second example uh, from Turkey, here's another anti-modernist Russian world art history written by a single art historian um, named Kemenov. He advocated social realism in art, uh, which was the official uh, art style. He also censored articles on Picasso as late as 1981. That is to say, when Russian uh, scholars tried to write about artists like Picasso, uh, they would have to submit them to official journals, and he's one of the people who kept those articles out of the journals as late as 1981. And he wrote uh, in a negative way about Picasso, Henry Moore, Jojo Keefe, Cezanne. He preferred artists like this. This is Vasily Surikov. Uh, it's from a photo. This is a photo from uh, Kamenov's book on Surikov. Kamenov's book uh, titled Artistic Heritage and Modernity from Leonardo da Vinci to Rockwell Kent is an interesting example of a kind of uh, world art history, in this case of modernism, heritage of modernism. Um, that, is, uh, that has a trajectory, that has a, a narrative which might seem a little bit implausible uh, if you're not uh, one of his intended readers. So this book begins with a long chapter on Leonardo da Vinci because he was a master of naturalistic skill. And Leonardo was also one of the main examples that was given to students, art students in Soviet art academies when they were learning Soviet socialist realism. Um, Leonardo was one of the main models along with Rembrandt. Kemenov's book continues through 19th century Russian realism, including a, a chapter on uh, this artist, um, a sculptor, uh, Konenkov. And it ends, really surprisingly, with a very pious chapter uh, full of praise devoted to the American artist Rockwell Kent. And that's because Kent was a Soviet sympathizer and he had a linear style, especially in his printmaking, that fit very well with Soviet realist uh, printmaking. So that uh, Kamenov example uh, is, an, is, in a different way, an example of uh, a narrative which tells, um, which tells a story that uh, probably would only be believable uh, in a very small circle of readership of students and colleagues. Um, and outside of that, it's going to look strange. And that's the theme that I want to develop in this lecture, that the way that narratives seem counterintuitive, like it seems that something's maybe a little bit wrong, about starting with Leonardo going through monumental Soviet sculpture and painting and ending up with an American, um, in the same way as the really large multi-volume history um, tells a story that seems to be, in the end, very much about uh, the Soviet domination of different countries. Second, a Turkish world art history. This is Burhan Toprak's book called Sanat Tarihi, History of Art. It's a Turkish art history textbook. From 1960. I'll just show about five or six pages so you can see the way that the story goes in this textbook. It begins in the ancient Middle East. It includes Anatolia, that's in the uh, region of present-day Turkey, and the Hittites, so that's appropriate for a book that's published in Turkey that it starts with ancient Middle Eastern art in the region of Turkey, and you can see the Egyptian uh, pyramids there. Um, Lascaux, of course, is European, 
and if they if the uh, author had started with uh, Sumeria or Babylon, that would be Middle Eastern, but it wouldn't be Turkish. So it's appropriate to start uh, in the ancient Middle East and specifically with Anatolia and the Hittites. Then the book continues through Greece and Rome, up through the Christian Middle Ages, and then it stops toward the end of the Middle Ages. And instead of talking about the Renaissance, uh, which every other world art history textbook would do, it goes on to the mid 20th century and talks a bit about modernism, especially Picasso from the 1950s, as you can see there, like bad Picasso from the 1950s. This is uh, not explained in the book, but uh, you can imagine why it might happen, and that is that there's a parade of, uh, of Christian art um, that after a while, as you tell the story of the Middle Ages in Europe, becomes kind of unavoidable. So instead of going to the, um, the culmination of that, he goes in a different direction. But then he moves back abruptly to the ancient Indus Valley, which is what you see in the middle picture there. That's in present day Pakistan. Um, on the left, that's Walter Gropius. That's the Bauhaus building um, in Dessau. Um, so, so, that's, so modernism gets that far, but then all of a sudden the narrative swerves and goes back in this direction toward um, ancient uh, Indian art and then also towards slightly later Indian art. And then it ends in 19th century Japan. As you can see, that's a Hokusai uh, and a Hiroshige print. So this is a trajectory that includes some of the central Western narrative, uh, at least um, from the point where it starts in Greece and Rome or in the ancient Middle East, if you'd like, uh, in Egypt, um, and all the way up through to the point where the uh, Renaissance is about to start. Uh, but then it swerves a couple of times um, and ends in a place which looks, it's actually a little um, detour back in time because he made it up to the 20th century with Picasso in the 50s um, and mid-century um, architecture, modernist architecture, but then swerves back in time, way back um, to the Indus Valley civilization and then um, not quite all the way up to the, where he had been in the present in the 19th century in Japan. It's hard even to summarize it. So this is a strange narrative. Um, for readers who are used to American and European versions of the narrative art, because it seems that Western art was just a series of experiments, Christianity first, modernism second, and that, and that neither one of them really worked out. Um, and so European art neither begins nor ends the narrative. So that this, is, this can seem incomplete and evasive both. It can seem like it starts in, a, in an odd place, ends in an odd place, and goes out of its way to avoid certain things, uh, as opposed to seeming uh, unaccountably inclusive, like the multi-volume Russian art history does, or as opposed to seeming idiosyncratic and quirky, like Kamenov's book does, does that ends with Rockwell Kent. Okay, the last example is a uh, world art history written in India. This was written by a teacher in an art school, Edith Tamuri. Um, she taught in Madras, um, and she wrote this book, History of Fine Arts in India and the West. Uh, she wrote it in 1982. Um, it's been reissued in digital version. That's what you're looking at there. This was a collaborative effort with faculty and students, and it was illustrated uh, largely with line drawings that were made by three of her colleagues. Um, I mentioned that in part because, um, like the, uh, like the um, Turkish uh, history, a number of uh, books that were published on a, on a low budget in um, parts of the uh, developing world, um, they couldn't, they, they couldn't uh, pay copyright permission and they didn't have the, um, the, 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 they didn't have the right uh, printers, they couldn't afford the printers to get high quality prints. So what they would do is make photocopies of postcards or in this case just draw the images. Um, which technically makes them copyright free. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of interesting publishing history that goes along with this as well, not my, which is not my topic here. So in the original edition, that's this uh, cover. It has a red cover and there's a red page that's right in the middle of the book. This is a thick book. Uh, so there's, it's, it's as if there were two books that were, um, that were printed together. The first half from the first title page up to the red page is simply called India and tells the history of Indian art. And the second half, after you turn the red page in the middle of the book, is called The West. Um, and it recounts the history of Western art from Egypt to the late 20th century. Um, the Western modernists that um, Tamuri talks about are people like David Hepworth, David Smith, George Segal. There's a, 
there is, as you would expect, an emphasis on English um, artists because of the because of the uh, colonial heritage, um, and it's uh, even though it was written in 1982, published in 1982. Um, it doesn't quite make it to that uh, moment in time. It stops a little bit before it, so it doesn't have uh, postmodernism in it. The end of the India half of the book uh, is also really unusual. Architecture ends with Mughal buildings, so it ends back in the 18th century. Um, one of the last examples is the Taj Mahal, so not, a, not at all contemporary. Sculpture ends with Chola Dynasty bronzes, that's 13th century AD, so that's even, even earlier. And that's because from Tamuri's point of view, Indian architecture and sculpture declined into what she calls decadence. But painting, she says, began to revive at the end of the 19th century. So uh, painting, the last the painting examples uh, are from the 1970s, which is almost contemporary with her book. And so what you're looking at here is these redrawn examples um, of um, paintings, um, in this case by uh, Silos Mukherjee, um, and there are a couple of others. So, this is part of the um, uh, uh, revival and contestation of modernism uh, in painting in India uh, that, that was underway throughout the 20th century, but especially um, after independence. Um, and so she's recording that, but she's exempting architecture and sculpture from that revival. The end of the Western half of the book also takes an unexpected turn because she doesn't try to disguise the fact that she really dislikes modern Western art. She's uncomfortable with modernism because she thinks that real art brings peace, wonder, and admiration rather than perturbation, emotion, and torment. So the conclusion sounds a little out of place on the last page of a history of Western art because there's no mention of postmodernism. Um, these are just some illustrations on the on the third to the last page, um, where you can see Picasso's glass of absinthe uh, on the right, and the Degas dancer uh, on the left. So this um, book by Edith Tamuri is a kind of schizophrenic book in the sense that it tells two equal stories, almost equal by weight because of the red page right in the middle, by weight and by length, but the two halves don't speak to each other. So. The implication is that uh, the art that's been made in India is the equal of art that's been made in the West, as she calls it, in the rest of the world. Um, and that also, it's also implied by that red page division that the two kinds of art are fundamentally different from each other. So you might imagine if, say, Gardner's Art Through the Ages or one of the contemporary North American textbooks, imagine if it was divided down the middle, say 500 pages for international art with a, with a sad ending, and then 500 pages for American art because the book's published in North America uh, with a happy or an optimistic ending. That would be what this is like. In, it's a really interesting test case, this book, because um, when people publish introductory texts of, uh, of world art in different countries, they always have to come to terms with this problem. How much space are you going to give to the art of your own, your, your own country or region? Naturally, you want to give more uh, because of the public and the, and the you know the, the people that you're writing for, the people who be reading it. On the other hand, it's not easy to, to decide how much more. And so this is a book that has a very simple solution to that. It's kind of um, it's clear. It's a clear decision, even though it's not um, defended in the book. It would be interesting if she had discussed it. So it can be very difficult to read books like this and find them convincing. Um, and that's because from each country's point of view, um, it's, the narrative seems natural. It doesn't seem like there's anything in need of, need of justification in any of these narratives that I've mentioned. Um, none, of the authors, um, none of the authors have introductions or um, uh, you know, special essays in which they say what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they chose their page counts and all the rest of that because the, the narratives that they chose seem natural to them. It's a good idea to compare textbooks to try to see what seems not to be adequate, fair, or persuasive about the textbooks made in the country that you're from. And if you're studying art history for the first time here in North America, the challenge is to see the narrative that you are uh, discovering in the textbook as something that's really not any more natural than any of these narratives that I've just been showing.